Welcome to the dark and creepy yet transcendent ultraviolet purgatory for the astonishing and unbelievable world. Filtered through science fiction spaceship gamma rays into the same type of building where the nine were first contacted by the characters we will discuss today. That building and this show is of course called The Farm. Today we have Christopher Knowles, Steve Snyder, and Jeremy Knight, as well as yours truly returning for a second look at aliens, wayward technology, and the misleading rumors around both. Who were the characters that accompanied Andrea Puharik in that farm that night? Chris, do you happen to know a thing or two about a few of those cats? Um, well, they were all blue bloods, from what I understand. Um, and I know, uh, I believe, Arthur... Young? Young of Bell Helicopter was there. Um, the... Uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but one thing uh, I would point out is that this was um, performed in Rockport, Maine, uh, Glen, the Glen, Clove, uh, Glen Cove area of Rockport, Maine in, in particular. And uh, just a couple of years ago, there was a, uh, a young man from Rockport, Maine, who was involved in a um, mass murder or multiple murder um, right outside of Fort Devens, uh, formerly known as the U.S. Army Intelligence School. Um, his family was uh, living in, in Groton, Massachusetts. Uh, he's from Rockport, Maine, which is uh, the home of Indria Puharich. Uh, he was a, a young musician who had never shown any signs of uh, violence or even mental illness, and um, he uh, just beat his family to death with a, with a baseball bat. And uh, wa- it took off all his clothes, um, slathered himself in mud, went next door and said, I, I killed my family. I need my medicine. Um, very, very uh, strange story, to say the least. So, yeah. yeah. In your research, have you found other sort of cases like this where there's some elitist getting around doing something spiritualist or magical seeming or a SRI, MK Ultra? kind of thing where they're either doing psychic experiments or secret experiments and in the same geographical area there being someone kind of losing their shit and and harming people well that's hard to say because i mean of course we are looking at a you know 67 year uh span of time between the two events um one, the one thing that I would point out is that, you know, I've done work into this character, um, Rear Admiral uh, Herbert Knowles, no relation, who was living in uh, Elliott, Maine, I believe, at the time, uh, next door to Portsmouth, um, New Hampshire, had known uh, Betty and Barney Hill personally, had known Francis Swan, who was involved in the, the Alpha channelings, and um, seemed to be at the epicenter of all the major uh, quote-unquote abduction events and, and alien contact events you know if you sort of drew a uh, circle with you know on a map with a compass you would have um, Allagash, Betty and Barney Hill, uh, Betty and Dreyason, um, that family out in western Massachusetts. Uh, if you t- went a little further you'd have the Hudson Valley sightings and with Streber uh, you know, just a whole, you would have the uh, the 66 flap in, in eastern Massachusetts. You would have uh, just a number of different events and flaps and uh, sort of UFO, UFO celebrities uh, all within a 100-mile radius uh, of this guy's house, if not less. So um, very interesting um, character uh, was involved with um, some very interesting people like... Um, uh, Air Marshal Vince Goddard, uh, number of different, or, sorry, Vic Goddard, not Vince, um, you know, a number of different people that were sort of involved in the world of uh, post-war high weirdness. And, and of course, you know, we're, we're talking about the U.S. Navy. Uh, he was also uh, Naval Intelligence, you know, all sorts of connections with this guy. So very interesting character and, you know, very interesting. And of course, you know, he was uh, not far from Glen Cove, Rockport, you know, where the uh, the nine channelings uh, took 
took place. I would not be surprised whatsoever if he was somehow involved in that whole situation because it seems like uh, he sort of had his fingers in a lot of different pies in that orbit. When you mentioned Betty and Barney Hill and some of the other people you mentioned in kind of the same geographical area, was this the same area that Aleister Crowley may have crossed over when in his U.S. adventures? Well, Crowley was up in Hebron, mm-hmm. which is um, a bit west, a bit northwest of this area. This is um, sort of on the, the, the coast, near the coast of you know, where Maine and New Hampshire sort of meet the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but, you know, Crowley was a bit further inland uh, in, in Hebron, oh, okay. so there wasn't you know, quite a direct connection there. But, you know, same general area. And, of course, this is all Lovecraft country, so, um, yes, you know, you've got the whole history there. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Well, actually, I, uh, I think I got the names now for you, and I can add a little bit to that. Uh, sure. Like it. Okay, so one of the things, too, about the Admiral Knowles that Chris is talking about here that I had kind of uncovered in my own research that was really quite interesting was that uh, in World War II during the Pacific Theater, which was, of course, a rather horrendous theater, he had served uh, alongside a Marine Corps general known as uh, Lemanuel Shepard. And uh, Shepard actually ended up uh, going in to become uh, part of the military committee and that kind of mysterious organization I talked about in our last podcast, the Sovereign Order of St. John, which had, uh, you know, Philip Corzo and Cleve Baxter and some of these other kind of curious figures linked to these fringe topics. So I definitely thought it was interesting that Knowles and Shepard had apparently served together in the Pacific. Knowles had, uh, I guess, transported Shepard's men repeatedly to the various islands and so forth. So certainly they probably would have seen some some pretty uh, heavy combat together. Uh, Getting into the names here, um, the first uh, official seance with the Nine was apparently, I believe, just with Puharic and uh, the mysterious uh, Dr. Vinod, Nude, something like that, which was on Christmas, or the last day of uh, December, uh, December 31st, going into the New Year's Eve, uh, January 1st. So, uh, from what I can tell, I think only Hank Jackson was maybe present and possibly the Youngs, but I'm not sure. The one, though, that you were thinking about earlier that had all the blue, bu- blue buds occurred um, a little over six months later on June 27th in 1953. And that's where you kind of get into a really impressive cast of characters. You had uh, a Henry and Georgia Jackson, which I've never really been able to come up with much in their background. Uh, Marcella DuPont was, of course, a member of the famous DuPont family. You had Arthur Young and Ruth Young. Uh, Mrs. Young was a member of the Payne family, uh, which was another kind of East Coast blue blood one, uh, Skull and Bones, you know, members in all the nine yards, which is interesting in light of some of the other connections we might get to later on. And um, probably the most interesting was uh, Alice Bouvier, who was uh, a member of the insanely powerful Astor family, uh, John Jacob Astor was kind of considered the patriarch of this clan. He uh, rose to prominence a little after the American Revolutionary War. It's been a lot of rumblings for years that the early family fortune was built off of uh, opium smuggling. Uh, at the time when I think it was his great, great, great grandson, if I remember correctly, died in the Titanic. This would be another John Jacob Astor. Uh, this one was considered to be the richest man in the world in some accounts. Of course, you also had the British wing of the Astor family that uh, had become deeply involved in setting up the Round Table group uh, at the same time. And then, of course, Puharic ended up naming his uh, foundation the Round Table group, I think, as well, which is kind of interesting in that regard. Do we know anything about Carl Betts or Vonnie Beck at all? Betts, uh, no, I hadn't really been able to turn up either much on Betts or uh, Beck. I did confirm Beck was not the actor. I believe some people had wondered about that. But yeah, those guys are a bit more enigmatic as well. So as far as I think we collectively understand it, um, and correct me if if I'm wrong, because I'm not sure about dates here, but Buharik was working within a CIA capacity at this time, or am I wrong about that? Uh, actually, I haven't seen any evidence that Buharik had worked for the CIA. It's most likely he did this stuff with the military. Um, Buharik had always alleged that he had been enlisted into a project that was known as Penguin, uh, I believe, in 1947 for the U.S. Navy, naturally. Uh, there's no evidence that there was a Project Penguin that ever existed. 
There is evidence, however, for a Project Pelican, which was quite a brutal program. Um, unfortunately, there's very little that's known about it, but what has come out is pretty horrific. Uh, the first accounts were really in around 75 or something when one of the psychologists who had been involved with it started to talk a little bit at a conference. And what came out was basically a full-blown, a clockwork orange type procedure where potential Navy assassins were strapped into a chair their eyes were clamped open and they were essentially shown, you know, films depicting horrendous scenes of violence, children being murdered and things of that nature. In an attempt to theoretically desensitize them and make them more effective killers. So this definitely plays into kind of the notion of uh, a super soldier program, if you will. It certainly seems like what the purpose of this was. And many of these naval programs along with the concurrent ones that the army was also working on and probably the air force as well later become entwined with artichoke and artichoke which i think is not necessarily commonly understood was very much a joint cia and pentagon project unlike mk ultra which was pretty much just the cia but the military had a very very heavy involvement in artichoke as well and a lot of it kind of derived from these earlier programs like pelican and chatter that had already been ongoing for several years when Bluebird, the predecessor to Artichoke, was launched. Sure. And uh, for our listeners, uh, a lot of the projects that Stephen just mentioned, we're going to be giving you a lot more information on, but certainly every idea in the media or in these projects in actual history that we can prove with documentation or every TV show, cartoon, and film that touches the concept of super soldiers. We're going to be bringing you a lot of information very soon about that stuff. But going back to the farmhouse and this sort of spiritualist seance, they wind up contacting nine entities that identify themselves as the nine gods of the Egyptian Heliopolis, I believe, and they say they're in a ship floating above the earth, which is, I think, from different sources. We may or may not be able to confirm the extent of that. Am I right so far about the general idea of what went down in the farm? Uh, I'm not sure if they identified themselves initially uh, as the pantheon of Egyptian gods. I know Puharic had also been doing research with a psychic, Peter Herkos, I believe his name was, uh, around the same time where basically he was giving him magic mushrooms and putting him in a Faraday cage, and that was where the uh, Egyptian jods kind of came into it. I'm not sure at which points, though, that he connected them to the Nine or not. And is this J.J. Hurtak character? Peter, Peter Herkos. I think it's Herkos, H-U-R-K-O-S, I believe. Is he in the fold at this time, or he's just someone who comments on this later? Uh, no, he was definitely a longtime colleague of Puharic's, I think, going back to probably the early 50s at least. He was a Dutch psychic that uh, Puharic had become you know, quite convinced that he was a very uh, powerful psychic, essentially, and he had done a lot of research with him. Okay. Do you guys think that... <clears throat> do you guys think that with the... At the time, psychotronic technology was just being pioneered, and in no public way, but in the CIA and in the intelligence realm, it was something they were just sort of getting excited about, and I think learning how to use. Do you guys think that these alien or Egyptian entities or intelligences that are talking to these nine human beings are perhaps a type of intelligence operation used to steer culture and these blue blood people with all their money and power to do certain things or do would we more think that these are actual uh, entities actual alien intelligences of some kind this stuff goes back a, a really 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 long way um i think there's some sort of misconception that this practice and this use of hallucinogens and all this kind of stuff was invented you know, during the Cold War, the post-war period, um, this goes back as long as you care to look. Um, this kind of work was being done in ancient Egypt. It was being done in Sumer. It was being done in Greece. Uh, it was being done all over the world, certainly uh, South and Central America. Um, this goes back a very, very long way. 
this is sort of a very time tested and uh, rather reliable <laughs> methodology that um you know is is really nothing new and i think the only thing that's different is that you know we have this sort of sense of cultural amnesia that you know, particularly with the rise of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution that, you know, oh, we don't bother with that kind of thing anymore. Of course, you know, people were doing that stuff more than ever during the Industrial Revolution. I mean, it was just wasn't really necessarily being publicized. So um, what uh, Puharich and his compatriots were up to and uh, all the rest of them uh, is just as old as the hills. So I, I don't think that there's really anything new or different about this, you know, other than the fact that there were people trying to weaponize this somehow. So these, these methods are as old as time and as old as we can tell. And as far as we know, they were using the <clears throat> spiritualist or magical method that would actually get them in contact with some kind of intelligence. And there's no reason <clears throat> to necessarily start thinking this could have been an intelligence op or a, a, an opportunity to get these people in one place. No, see, them. well, here's the thing. We know about the the whole situation with Glenn Cove and the Council of Nine, primarily through um, Puharich's book, Uri Geller, you know, his Uri book, 74 book that he had written about Geller. And, and by this time, you know, um, Puharich was getting high off his own supply for quite some time. And Puharich really popped his cork in some ways. I mean, he went from being a very promising and, uh, you know, sort of star capable army chemist to being, you know, basically sort of uh, a lingering embarrassment for the CIA, um, you know, because the CIA had tasked him to be uh, Gala's handler. Um, Puharich uh, had been tripping balls for Oh, golly. Uh, by this time, at least 20 years, um, fairly regularly, um, you know, he had done this kind of work uh, long before, um, you know, we heard about it in the Gala book. And we see, you know, if you look carefully, I mean, I've written about this in the past, but if you look carefully, you can see the Council of Nine show up quite, um, you know, not under the same name, but, you know, certainly their um, description show up in, in episodes of Star Trek as early as the first season. So this is nothing new. This has been going on for a very long time. Praharich, um basically, uh, you know, spilled the beans, uh, you know, told tales out of school, let the cat out of the bag, all that kind of, you know, metaphor and allegory. I mean, this is this is just this is just nothing new. I mean, if you go back, I mean, I, I've written about this, and I should probably repost a lot of this stuff, but, you know, if you look at the Mithraic liturgy, I mean, you know, Mithraic cults were, um, Mithraic cults were, you know, composed of the same kind of people that were involved in, um, you know, the stuff that we're talking about, you know, uh, military intelligence, uh, you know, in, in this case would be, you know, the Praetorian Guard, uh, you know, spies, I mean, all these kind of people, uh, you know, were, um, you know, tripping balls and, 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 having bizarre contacts um, and, and then writing it down. So uh, if you, you know, if you read the Mithraic liturgy from the, you know, from the Paris uh, Codex library, uh, it's pretty clear that, um, you know, exactly what, what is being described here. And it, it's really, I, I don't think it's substantially different at all from anything that, that Puharich has ever described or uh, accounted. You kind of just uh, wandered <clears throat> into my next two questions for you specifically. So either one of these you want to um, answer or you think there's there's more of a valid reason to answer. Were there other, and you kind of answered this already, I'm sorry, but were there other examples in history of nine beings being contacted in other mythologies and, and belief systems with the same sort of archetypal energy, the same, you know, there's at least nine of them and they have different uh, archetypal sort of skills they bestow upon mankind. And then the other question is just what ways did Gene Roddenberry try to express these ideas about the nine? Um, we know that there's a lot of episodes in the first season of Star Trek, but were there other films or scripts or even failed ideas that Roddenberry tried to insert this into? Well, you know, 
I don't know how much of it is, is Roddenberry per se. Um, so as your first question, I mean, the, the obvious answer is, of course, the Ennead, the, the, the nine primal gods of, you know, Middle Kingdom Egyptian mythology. And, um, you know, earlier in the 20th century, you had the, you know, the nine unknown, the nine unknown men, uh, you know, this whole idea that there was a, a council of nine, you know, somewhere in the Himalayas that were, you know, taking care of everything and make sure that the world uh, runs smoothly. Um, so, you know, this this has repeated throughout history. Uh, you know, as far as um, with Roddenberry and Star Trek and so on and so forth, I mean, you could you could probably argue that, you know, even from the very beginning, um, uh, the cage is just basically a, a sort of a standard issue alien abduction uh, narrative that incorporates a number of different tropes from, you know, say fairy abduction lore and, and all these kind of things, you know, it was just given sort of the sci-fi gloss, uh, you know, by this time, uh, I don't know how much of that was actually Roddenberry, how much of that would have been Leslie Stevens. Uh, I, I think that probably a lot of it was Leslie Stevens as far as the plotting and then Roddenberry would come in with all the speechifying and, and so on, you know, that, which has seemed to be his specialty. Um, we see the nine in Errand of Mercy, which is where also the uh, the Klingons are introduced. And we we have this sort of pastoral rural civilization that seems to be like, you know, easy pickings for the Klingon Empire to knock over. And then you find out that, you know, these people are actually uh, ruled over by these uh, beings that exist beyond time and space and, and knock out all the nuclear weapons and so on. And, you know, one thing that I pointed out in the blog is that this comes straight from a story that uh, Raymond Palmer had had published in one of his magazines called Son of the Sons, which was written by this uh, woman who was involved in the whole uh, West Coast uh, proto-Scientology circles, you know, people who had contact with... with, um, you know, with Hubbard and, and Parsons and a lot of these other people, you know, sort of like a very small circle of, of people who were involved in, you know, these fringe uh, occult and esoteric uh, pursuits because, you know, the stuff was really not very popular at that point in time. You know, particularly, you know like late 40s, early 50s, you really didn't have a lot of that stuff going on. I mean, uh, you know, really the OTO uh, was basically defunct after um, Parsons died. So, you know, there really wasn't, and it wasn't even that much to write home about when, when he was alive. So we, we take for granted that this stuff was um, not only not mainstream, but it was, was practically invisible. So these people that were involved in the stuff at that point in time, you know, were uh, part of uh, a rarefied company. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is that this stuff um, filtered in through these people into Star Trek. Um, the director of Aaron to Mercy was a guy named John Newland, and John Newland was uh, very tight with um, Puharich and actually had uh, taken magic mushrooms on the air on his show um, One Step Beyond, uh, the the infamous Sacred Mushroom episode, and he's the guy who um, directed that episode. So there's a pretty clear uh, chain of custody, so to speak, of of how this information is going from fringe players like Paharich into, uh, you know, network television. Uh, Gene had a uh, script for something called The God Machine, and I don't know if that ever came to fruition, but it certainly seemed to show up in one of the Star Trek films. There was also... The first one. The first one, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, you can look at the, the stuff he did for The Nine, which really... Um, his treatment, which is called uh, Battlefield Earth, you know, unlike Hubbard's Battleground Earth, or right, maybe it's vice versa. I'm not so sure, but it's um, vice versa. But yeah, yeah, but um, that had ended up in the series Earth Final Conflict, and if you watch the first season of that episode, I, I think it's pretty clear that it's it's definitely a nine allegory, and uh, you know, it's sort of the truest to um, what uh, uh, Roddenberry. Had it had it intended, even though a lot of that script was actually ghostwritten by one of his assistants. So um, yeah, I mean Roddenberry, um, I think is widely overestimated by people as far as 
what he actually did. Um, you know, he was very much sort of the spiritual godfather of Star Trek, but most of the actual work was done by other people. So I was uh, just briefly thinking about things like the Questor tapes and other pilots that were never made in the shows that had a weird technology alien connection or central theme that I didn't know if the nine was still dripping its way into. But more importantly, you mentioned Leslie Stevens. Did Outer Limits or Twilight Zone ever have episodes that seemed like they were trying to get out or reflect some of this information in, in a way? Oh, definitely Outer Limits. Mm -hmm. Definitely Outer Limits. Um, not specifically in the context of the nine, but um, if you watch those, those old episodes, you're going to see a lot of the... Um, Ideas that were, you know, germinating in UFO and in occult circles uh, played out there. Um, There's even like what the one scene where they uh, look at the dollar bill kind of inexplicably and go into the, uh, uh, you know, the symbolism with the pyramid and what have you, whether doing that uh, science experiment or something to that. Yeah, effect. controlled experiment. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's a that's an interesting episode because, <clears throat> you know, the whole concept of it is that. You know, Earth is being controlled by by Martians, you know, uh, by aliens, and they will come down from time to time and just sort of keep an eye on how everything's moving along. And, and that episode was written by by Leslie Stevens himself. Um, you know, his episodes are, are very, very interesting in that. I mean, they're not always the most compelling dramatically, but um, they're always about you know, alien contact through means other than spaceships landing mm -hmm. on the planet Earth. Uh, you know, for instance, in the first, in the, in the pilot. It's the interdimensional alien one, right? Yeah, um, yeah, see yeah. The viewer, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. He's, yeah, he's contacted and in, in, he travels to this world through, um, you know, radio waves. Uh, mm -hmm. He sort of manifests himself because he's he's an energy being. And then he did the episode "The Borderlands," which is about um, these scientists trying, you know. And it's interesting because there's a whole spiritualist me, uh, seance that's depicted in that episode. And this guy saying, "Well, listen, that those people are frauds. You know what you really got to do is you got to do it this way, and you know through uh, scientific methods to cross over cross dimensional barriers." And then you had control experiment, and then you had. Um, production and decay uh, of strange particles, you know, with a early Leonard Nimoy appearance. That's, you know, basically um, kind of what we saw in Twin Peaks in episode eight, where, you know, the splitting of the atom sort of unleashes these uh, beings, these, you know, that, it, that the splitting of the atom opens up a dimensional gateway and uh, these kind of demonic beings are able yeah. to cross into our world. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So. so if not the nine, Outer Limits showed a bunch of different methods through which, and most of them technological, through which a, a single person seems to be losing their mind or nobody really knows what they're doing and can understand what they're doing. And in this very Jack Kirby way, there's a bunch of different venues to show different technologies and methods through which we can let them enter our world. Or I forget the exact quote from the Kirby panel, but uh, show me how to get into your world. <laughs> Chris, you probably know that. I'll thing. show you how to bring me to your world. Yeah. Um, yeah. I really recommend that everybody, if you haven't yet watched the first, at least the first season of the original Outer Limits because it's just, it's just absolutely mind boggling. Um, yeah, it's fabulous. <laughs> and, and Stevens is a very, you know, very, very interesting character because, you know, his father, uh, was one of the, uh, <laughs> one of the, you know, major players in, in, uh, post-war and, and pre-war, uh, you know, the Navy, um, he, he really was, the man who made the aircraft carrier, which is you know, the engine room of the uh, the Navy's global reach, um, he made that possible. Um, he was involved in all kinds of things. I mean, if there ever was a, a real Majestic 12, this guy probably would have been running it. Um, and uh, his son, uh, you know, Leslie Stevens, um, uh, became a very, very interesting 
shadow men uh, in in Hollywood. And, uh, you know, basically, I mean, if you look at, you know, if you want to talk about Star Trek, I mean, Star Trek is just basically, uh, it's an Outer Limits episode, you know, writ large. So many of the, the people in front of the camera and behind the camera were uh, were his, you know, not only uh, people that he had worked with, but were his people, you know, the, his, his guys, his people that had worked for him, uh, you know, for instance, Robert Justman, who was the line producer on Star Trek, was that was you know Stevens's right hand man, and Roddenberry when he was um, working on the pilot for uh, Star Trek was working at you know in Leslie Stevens' uh, Daystar Studio. So I I, I really believe that this uh, very strong lines of continuity, and um, you know if you look at Star Trek and the way it's been used. Uh, throughout the past 50 years, I, I, I would argue very strongly that Star Trek is a project of naval intelligence and uh, has always has been from the beginning and has been continued to be used by people in, in that orbit to um, advance, you know, certain social agendas. And so that's how we, we wind up getting in a further sphere, series like Deep Space Nine. But if memory serves, there was a lot of um, kind of like you were saying, like uh, Gene and and Leslie would sort of visit the set of each other's show if Gene wasn't on the set of Outer Limits the whole time and sort of appreciate and, and share ideas and then all the way down to particular props and masks and things. All the sci-fi shows at that time would share a lot of material. So an alien floating in the middle of the space, at, middle of space rather, that the Enterprise would come across would would half an hour later be 20,000 leagues under the sea and and they would just take that same costume and put it on a guy and put him in the water and that would be yeah a, yeah a but i mean i don't think goes. yeah i don't think the relationship between roddenberry and stevens was was a two-way street i think it was a one-way street i think it was basically roddenberry um being set up with an office at daystar um was watching uh outer limits dailies Every day, I mean, he's basically training under because Roddenberry really didn't have a lot of experience. I mean, he he had had one television series that had been canceled. That was the Lieutenant, and mm-hmm. um, he was kind of out of work, and he really didn't have uh, a, a great deal of experience under his belt. So I, I think basically he was put uh, under Stevens to be uh, mentored. Because he, he he said he had an interest in science fiction. He, he didn't. I mean, uh, there's been some really interesting material written about uh, Roddenberry. There's a, a book that um, sort of punctures uh, a lot of the suppositions that had grown up through um, Star Trek fandom about Roddenberry. And, and, you know, I think in the past 20 years, I, I think a lot of those myths have been debunked, you know, particularly within Star Trek fandom. So he really was not... Um, the the Svengali that he liked to picture himself as. I, I think that he was uh, in many ways a figurehead. And I think that a lot, a lot of that had to do with um, the fact that he was very wise to uh, cultivate the fan audience. And that really um, allowed him to uh, take hold of the, the franchise in, in a way that I don't think, you know, anybody else would be able to do, you know, today. Sure. Yeah. I, you know, I, a lot of the work I did in cartoons, I spent a lot of time with the Star Trek show because I felt that um, there was a lot of nine ish stuff going on there. And if not there, if not that, then just similar deep and interesting ideas about contacting aliens and about the way we view our old gods and things like that. The um, how sharp a serpent's tooth and the magic's of Magustu collectively showing Claire's to call coming back and yelling at us because we never figured out the right way to build the pyramids to worship him correctly so he could come back and give us more knowledge and uh, and basically control us turns into Kirk giving Claire's to call a speech about humans are far enough along and we don't need gods anymore. M- Magics of Magustu has the crew running into Lucifer right off the bat whose name is Lucian, in at least the beginning of the show. 
and then Asmodeus and some other unidentified beings bring them to kind of like a holographic representation of Salem, where there's a huge pentagram on the ground and the Star Trek crew is put on trial and it ends with Kirk having like a high magic war with Asmodeus. But in the middle of the episode, Spock traces a pentagram on the ground and stands in it and thinks that he knows enough about magic to like suddenly have telepathy and psychic powers and such. And he starts moving chess pieces across the room with his mind by standing in the pentagram <clears throat> and just using the basic laws of magic he's picked up from Lucifer in this world that Lucifer was expelled from. And they have nine glowing entities with yellow eyes and strange cloaks that appear in the episode when Asmodeus is trying to explain like how magic started and the first beings that had mastered it and things like that. But I would recommend the cartoon for anybody who's into any of these ideas, but very much if you're into Star Trek in general, don't pack that one up. The one thing I've found consistently throughout all cartoons, but particularly in the 80s and 90s, is every animated series has a lot of episodes where the theme of the episode is in all of the shows collectively. And one of the ones that's the most obnoxious is not an alien invasion, but a false flag alien invasion. So sort of taking Werner von Braun's claims on his supposed deathbed that Carol Rosen is always repeating about there being nazism which would be followed by communism which would be followed by terrorism and they would play the terrorism card for as long as they could use up as much money and resources and get as many countries and extreme religions and everything extreme beliefs wrapped up into terrorism so it would go on forever but if terrorism would eventually fall because we were just too intelligent and we could see through eventually the way that some of us do research in order to understand that maybe 9-11 and our reason for attacking seven different countries isn't what, you know, CNN tells us it is. Um, after terrorism would play out, like I'm saying, we'd see through it, there would be a false flag alien invasion. And one can only just start to use one's imagination to piece together that the technology level at which predator drones and things like that are at, the technology level of our stealth craft and any craft that, according to Lucifer's technology, uh, Chris's Secret Sun series, sort of says that we, we may have back-engineered alien technology, something that started with Philip Corso's book, The Day After Roswell, where he posed that idea. And ever since, we've been wondering about things like Kevlar and lasers and computers and all sort of technology that we've discovered since 47 or since the Roswell crash, you can easily start to piece together how if the right people with the right resources wanted to, they could take a few toys out of their black projects and mix them with drones and CNN, which is in all the major news sources, which will do whatever they're told to do. They will inform us of whatever worldview they're given that morning. Uh, by an army psychological operations unit or intelligence agency or whoever has interest in kind of painting the worldview for that day or that week, you can easily see how we've been, a lot of, pe a lot of people like to go back to the term predictive programming and how many films and TV may be preparing us for multiple different scenarios which may or may not happen and some of which can flow into the others. So all movies about the end of the world and that kind of anxiety and kind of cold war anxiety can now be pulled into whether you know there's massive floods or a fake alien invasion so in every single cartoon series uh ninja turtles gi joe there's always the bad guys that show up in every episode to, to do whatever in gi joe they have a direct military industrial complex link and a specific group of people in the bad guys to kind of represent every aspect of the MIC gone wrong. And then there's some episodes that get, there's some shows that get even more curious with it, where in a bunch of shows, the aliens want to get the gold out the federal reserve to power their ships, a bunch of episodes where the bad guys create some sort of synthetic robotic life to pilot UFOs. So the news can at least 
shoot something real in the sky when they're trying to terrorize everyone with the idea of a massive invasion and you can track this idea like i'm saying from spider woman which i believe was in 77 all the way to the more contemporary uh men in black cartoon um cops ninja turtles you know like i said you you could you could go through every almost every single cartoon has that episode in gi joe it's very strange because i mentioned how von braun moved from communism to terrorism to then the false flag invasion in 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 what he was trying to tell us would go down and in gi joe one of the gi joes is kidnapped while they are working with russia in afghanistan or iraq or something like that i think it's afghanistan and there the idea is to secure these oil pipelines and then snake eyes gets abducted by two ufos and the only information you're given about the ufos is they came from sirius b and then when snake eyes is on the uh, abduction table the infamous cold table that one is strapped down to they find themselves strapped down to after they're abducted off the ground or out their car or whatever a middle eastern terrorist walks over and i just say that because that's exactly what they're trying to draw it's a very very osama bin laden looking character in a cartoon from 1995 and 96 and osama bin laden takes off his mask and he's an alien perhaps the one from sirius b and the alien takes off his mask and it's actually just one of it's a zartan i believe just one of the privately contracted villains who who works for the um who works for cobra but represents more of a blackwater um sort of organization so i just wanted to give everybody uh, a roundup of the cartoons um rick doty and peter lavenda have controlled so much of the flow of information in a whole bunch of fields that we're all collectively interested in if you really think about it uh lavenda has controlled everything from or or just you know done research on i don't mean to use the word control but a lot of our contemporary worldview is based off of the for people who really dig in and try to do the research is based off of things like sinister forces or that version of the necronomicon almost everyone has or everyone's friends have on a shelf the paperback of the necronomicon which is actually the simonomicon and was supposedly written and rituals experimented with by lavenda in some of the groups he was in, in in new york back in the day when that when that book came out so rick doty uh is responsible for perhaps everything from the invention of the dulcy base and underground strange alien experiments um all the way to project serpo which happens to take place on my birthday supposedly and is the last scene in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Um, so a lot of what we think about supposedly the alien technology in the private and corporate sectors, uh, you know, and a lot of what we think about just aliens in general, a lot of the different conspiracies that were running around like wildfire in the 90s could have all come from these two men or these two men and their close associates and publishers and, and whatever who may or may not have been onto the, the scheme if it is one do you guys think that because rick doty and lavenda attend the same uh steven what is the veterans organization that they both i'm glad attend? you brought that up yeah that's uh that's a very interesting topic it's uh me organiz- so pardon just, me i'm just gonna hand the uh hand it to you please explain okay. everything you want it's a uh, an organization that's known as the association of uh former intelligence officers it was uh set up in the early 60s by a man named uh david atley phillips and phillips uh is very significant figure to jfk assassination researchers he uh was of course a longtime cia agent and he's generally believed by a lot of Ken- of uh, JFK assassination buffs to have been the uh, man who's generally known as Maurice Bishop. Uh, that was an alias, and this was the individual who was working with a lot of the anti-Castro Cubans in New Orleans and so forth during this time. And a lot of people think that Maurice was 
one of the leading figures behind the assassination plot. So if Phillips was Maurice Bishop, obviously that would mean he was a central figure in the assassination. But anyway, let's fast forward to the early 70s. Uh, Phillips was also a guy who played a role in the coup d'etat in Chile that uh, unfolded actually on September 11th, 1973 that brought uh, Pinochet to power. Uh, of course, this was a brutal dictatorship, and this also kind of paved the way for the infamous Colonia Dignidad to become uh, essentially a part of Chile's uh, security apparatus, more or less. Something so, else that Lavenda, if Lavenda Yes, did. yes, it's talked about a lot, yes, yes. Yeah, of course, about. he, so yeah, I mean, he even made the pilgrimage to Chile in the late 70s to kind of look into that, but, uh, from what I gather, uh, Phillips also using the association of former intelligence officers to kind of use that as a lobbying pressure group in the early years to help bring Pinochet to power. Now, going forward, uh, getting into Lavendia and Dotti, uh, basically these guys are involved with one specific chapter of the association of former intelligence officers, and that chapter is naturally uh, the Las Vegas chapter. Of course, for those of you who have read uh, Chris's writings on the Secret Sun, you know, that should let's uh, set off a lot of red flags to put it mildly Vegas is huge and a lot of this kind of stuff uh, especially within the UFO field but there are two other interesting individuals who were involved with them or who are involved with them in this Las Vegas chapter of the Association of Former Intelligence Officers They're Stephen both... I just want to I just want to cut in for just a quick second oh, I mean, sure 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 you know where, do you know where these people meet do you know where the, do they have like a, an office or something I mean I, I'm just wondering if if it's just sort of like a um informal sort of free-floating organization or they have like actual real estate i guess i'm not I, yeah i'm not sure about that i i've heard things about that but i can't really talk about it so um but yeah i, I will I can just theorize i think it's the same kind of places that the round table meets the same sort of venues whether it be a hotel lobby or an actual military related kind of small museum or a lion's club or a Masonic related building. Uh, I, from what I gather it would be something like that, but it would I, be I mean, something probably low key based on some of the things that I've heard that have gone on in these meetings. Um, yeah, I don't want to get into that too much. I can't really say too much more about that, uh, sure. but getting into the things that I can prove with open source material. Um, there are definitely two other interesting individuals who were involved in this. Uh, both of whom were uh, former U.S. Army colonels. Uh, one of them was Colonel John Alexander, and the other one is uh, Colonel Michael Aquino. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the people who are listening to this are very familiar with these two men. Uh, Alexander was kind of involved in a lot of the remote viewing stuff in the 1980s. He kind of held these um, spoon-bending parties, if you will, in the D.C. area. He was involved with the Moreau Institute and so forth. And uh, for our purposes here, it's really interesting that he was also one of the major early advocates of uh, what are now known as non-lethal weapons, which is kind of, uh, there's a lot of uh, speculation that the non-lethals were sort of continuation of these, you know, psychotronic weapons that you were discussing earlier. Alexander has just been a major proponent of this stuff for years. He um, had actually begun, uh, after he had gotten out of the military, to lobby for it for with a very far-right organization called the uh, U.S. Global Security Council that was set up by Ray Klein, uh, another very infamous former CIA guy who's been linked to a lot of just far-right regimes over the world and so forth. But um, Alexander, through this group, was able to first get really acknowledgement uh, during the Bush one years for these non-lethal weapons and procure funding for the research. And uh, ironically, the Secretary of Defense that had initially signed off on this was an uh, individual named Richard Cheney, Dick Cheney, who eventually became our vice president. So, yeah, I mean, Alexander got some interesting access with this and, uh, you know, he's been continuing to push this stuff for years now and he's also another major figure in the ufo community he was allegedly part of the so-called um avery i believe that was what it was called uh yes. with Doty and a with lot of Doty. these other characters yeah yeah and he so, now writes uh ufo books publicly but aquino and alexander together took psychological operations from aquino's initial manual mind war all the way up into personally seeing to it that psychotronics would evolve to the place they are today. And of course, Aquino is also infamous as the founder of the Temple of Set, which really brought a lot of uh, Kenneth Grant. Well, I mean, all, his, Kenneth Grant's ideology was already getting kind of mainstream, but Aquino seems to have been an early figure who latched onto this 
in the well, 70s. Wait, uh, let me cut in again. Steven, sure, sure. is there any um, uh, documented connection between Aquino and, and Grant? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. Uh, like we've kind of seen with everything with Grant. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an you can never find the connections, but all at least on a personal level that these guys were spending time with each other. But yes, Aquino became obsessed with his ideology in the 70s. And then Peter Tompkins became obsessed with it. Um, yeah, I but again, you know, it's been it really seems like there was a deliberate effort to obscure, you know, whether uh, Grant actually knew these individuals in real life. But it seems all but certain that he would have. It's, yeah, yeah. We know that he, we know that Aquino became disenchanted with LaVey, correct? With uh, LaVey. Yes, yes, yes. He had originally started in the Church of Satan, and then essentially he thought that LaVey was a clown, more or less, and wanted to go into something that was a little more serious. Uh, of course, I guess Aquino, you know, he would also become fascinated with Nazism in the 1980s, while probably even earlier than that, I should say. But uh, yes, I believe he once referred to the Third Reich as the ultimate personification of magical power or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. um, he's also really the one, too, who crafted a lot of the modern Black Sun ideology, especially with the castle and um, what is the castle's name? Well, that's fair. Yes, Wellesburg. Yes, yes. I mean, he went there in, I think, 86, maybe sometime slightly before then, performed some kind of ritual and was apparently quite taken with the results that he had gotten there. He would since go on to associate the Black Sun with that castle, even though the ties had been rather tenuous before then. There is the sun wheel that's in the castle but we don't really know when that came from whether it was put in during the nazi era where it had, whether it had predated it that or not but aquino was just huge in crafting this ideology that has since become major in a lot of uh, esoteric nazi circles so aquino i mean even though he's not a well-known figure to the public at large this guy has just had an enormous influence on a lot of very fringe and very extreme occult circles. So yeah, supposedly Himmler would, I'm sorry, third time oh, trying to do this. Uh, Himmler so, would stand on the Black Sun symbol and use the top SS men who had been killed and put their skulls on swords. And there were other SS men who weren't allowed to know anything about this, but they were guarding the area. And we just know from their journals and things that there were strange lights, strange multicolored purple and green Vril-esque <laughs> lights emanating from the space i don't know how well you can source that information it's just what i heard on the topic there's only one scholar on the black sun and the frill but who's allowed who has keys to wellisburg and goes in and, and studies uh that place besides lavenda i can't think of that man's name right now but i'm, I'm so sorry go on yeah, I don't know about that. Like I said, there's been a lot of misinformation that was put out. Uh, some of it was exaggerated, no doubt. But yes, there doesn't seem to be much question that something very strange was going on there. But yeah, I mean, you've got Aquino. I mean, he's a psychological warfare officer. That was his typical function. Uh, he would... He claims that he didn't hook up with John Alexander until they had met through the Association of Former Intelligence Officers in uh, the early part of this particular century. But uh, that's certainly very debatable. I mean, given the interest that these two men had, their place in the military in the 1980s and just the general close relation between special forces, which is what Alexander was involved in, and psychological warfare. Both are essentially considered uh, aspects of covert operations and so forth and historically have worked very close together. So there's a very good chance that they would have been aware of each other at some point uh, while they were in the armies in the 1980s, especially with their you know, certain interests together. So yeah, you've got these two guys here in Aquino and Lavenda who have done a lot to promote this ideology of Kenneth Grant, the Typhonian tradition or whatever the heck it's called, uh, the so-called Dark Lord, if you will, sets, what have you. Uh, these guys are here, you know, in the Association of Former Intelligence Office in the Las Vegas chapter together. Doty's there, who has just rev, you know, wrecked havoc on the UFO community for years now, decades with, you know, disinformation and so forth. And you've got John Alexander, Mr. Non-Lethal Weapons. Mm -hmm. Who now writes, as I was saying, who now writes, you know, books on UFOs uh, that are just kind of these general... I'm finally going to do a scientific analysis of the UFO phenomenon or whatever. But it seems within the four men, if they wanted to, 
they certainly could have shaped the last two to three decades of everything from occult beliefs to the UFO phenomenon, particularly now that Lavenda has strayed from being my favorite author and one of the people I look up to the very most next to Stephen and Christopher that I'm talking to right now, except he made this turn I could never see any of us making, which is dedicating himself to backing up Tom DeLonge and, and the To The Stars effort. And I interviewed him. If people listening are interested, just go back in the Farms episodes to uh, one of two interviews with Lavenda, I believe, where I spent the entire time, unfortunately, just trying to ask him, what is up with this? Why is this happening? Why does, is he a true believer suddenly when before he would never um, assume things or belong to something so silly? I don't mean to just outright call it silly, but they're still trying to sell you beer cozies and get your money to build a UFO as an answer to disclosure if anybody else wants to comment on to the stars feel free well i mean the first thing that should really scare the hell out of anybody with uh to the stars is the fact that the melon family is involved in it i mean if any of you guys have read uh my blog out there i mean the melon family of pittsburgh they don't get you know the press that the rockefellers the rothschilds do but they are phenomenally powerful phenomenally wealthy and they have been involved uh in the U.S. intelligence community, really, since its inception with the OSS years ago, uh, one of the big figures in uh, To the Stars is a man named Christopher Mellon, who uh, was on, I believe, the Senate's uh, intelligence advisory board for a lot of years. He was an advisor to Jay Rockefeller on intelligence matters. Very, very well connected, and it's also utterly shocking that he would have that kind of access. Uh, he really grew up outside of the United States. Uh, and uh, the particular uncle who's had a lot of influence on his life uh, has lived most of his life in Switzerland and is currently now, I believe, being prosecuted by the U.S. government for tax evasion and what have you. So Mellon is one of those figures. It's downright baffling that he would have the kind of access he did if it were not for probably the insane family connections that he has. Uh, Sorry. Let me just interject here. Uh, Mellon has been involved with, with UFO stuff, <laughs> let's just say. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to really make a value judgment as to what this DeLong operation is all about. But um, Mellon's been involved with this stuff. I, I think he probably he might have come in through, through the Rockefeller initiative because he's been weaving in and out of this field for quite some time. I, I don't think that um, I, I don't think he would have been placed into uh, to the stars just because of his family connections. I, I think that he is probably much more of a driving force behind this operation, uh, you know, certainly more than Lavenda. I think Lavenda's sort of, uh, you know, a scrivener, so to speak. He's just sort of carrying water for this group, um, you know, as is DeLong, by the way. Um, I, he's been involved in this, in ufology for quite some time, so I, I would not say that he's, um, you know, just a, a, a beneficiary of nepotism in this case. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I meant, uh, I actually meant his access in the intelligence community was probably initially driven by nepotism, at least the level of access that he was getting. But yes, definitely into the stars. Yes, it wasn't his family connections. It was already the extensive ties, no doubt, that he had within the UFO community and his intelligence connections and so forth. So right in between all these characters like Mellon and Lavenda still talking about to the stars, we have someone who would have been associated with Ingo Swan or John Alexander or uh, any any of these psychic viewer type people, uh, Hal Putha, which is the most curious addition to this cast of characters, in in my opinion. Does anyone have any um, interesting tidbits about him or opinions they want to share about To the Stars and Hal Putha? Well, Putha was involved in the earliest days of the you know, the Stanford research work on remote viewing. And he was involved with Puharich and with Uri Geller. So, um, you know, he's been, he's been swimming in these waters for a very long time. So I'm really not surprised that, that he would be involved in it. I, 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 I'm, the only reason I'm surprised is that I just think he would be, you know, reaching retirement age and would, would not want to 
involve himself in this kind of work, you know, at his late date. But, uh, you know, he's, um, you know, these guys just keep going till they drop, I guess. <laughs> For anyone who wants to keep track of a more sober perspective of a lot of the people behind to the stars and people that aren't discussed very often, like Jim, Sammy Van, uh, and, and Christopher Mellon and, and so forth. Uh, look up Grant Cameron because he's someone who uh, is also going to go until he drops. And he's spent so much time trying to personally interact with these people, check their correspondences, pull documents out of anywhere he can find them, including newly released material from the, um, I was about to say Whitley Strieber, uh, Stanton Friedman Library. And uh, I just I just suggest taking a look at that for sure. Does anybody else have anything they want to add to to this discussion is there any more any more notes or points well, anybody's the, hang the, on thing, the thing that I, I would just point out um you know as far as this las vegas connection is that um the initial leak that uh the two to stars academy and all this kind of stuff was going to uh hit the the mainstream media um took place nine days after um you know the whole situation with mandalay bay and uh highway 91 and uh stephen paddock and uh janet air um all that stuff uh you know so nine days after that we had um the announcement that was first uh, leaked into the media by um john Desta. <laughs> who had, had tweeted about this. And I, I believe that uh, DeLong might have had, you know, retweeted. Uh, and given the amount of Lockheed people that are involved in um, uh, To the Stars, it's, it's, it's very curious, you know, considering this whole situation with uh, Janet Eyre, you know, because basically uh, Area 51 and, and S4 and, and, you know, whatever, Groom Lake, Dreamland, whatever you want to yeah, call it, yeah. um, is... is, is pretty much a, a Lockheed, uh, you know, summer camp, so to speak. It, it's uh, very heavily dominated by Lockheed. And I, I think that Lockheed is a company that a lot of people don't really pay as much attention to as they should because Lockheed um, is huge. Uh, I think they're much bigger than they're given public and acknowledgement for. Uh, and they seem to be driving uh, a lot of the stuff and they certainly seem to be driving um, a lot of the space program. Uh, I think that, um, you know, with Paddock, I, you know, I still have no idea what that situation was really about. I, I don't believe that, um, he was a lone gunman, so to speak. I, I think that there were, um, people, uh, behind the stage, uh, you know, shooting into the crowd because I, I'm not even sure that, uh, you know, that he was even shooting live rounds. I, I think that that was some sort of operation, uh, you know, the it's pretty much been dropped. Um, <clears throat> you know, the official story never made, made sense at all. Uh, there were all these discrepancies in the timeline. Um, you know, the the Las Vegas sheriff just sort of uh, backed away from it uh, very gingerly, and you know, it's never been dis been um, explained or. Uh, Certainly not solved. So I, I think that there's a lot of, you know, a lot of very weird and nebulous uh, activity behind that. And the fact that the it seemed to uh, somehow sync up with this whole to the stars thing is, is very curious to me. And, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know. I can't say what if or what any kind of uh, exact connection these events would have to one another. I just find the timing to be extraordinarily curious. And uh, I still uh, would love to, you know, really find out what, 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 what went on there because I just don't believe that a, a rather sickly 64 year old man, a millionaire would um, decide to uh, <coughs> open fire with a bump stock you know, uh, a weapon system that you probably have an extraordinarily difficult time operating because of the, the recoil. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's just so many questions uh, about that. 
and so many discrepancies and just so many outright lies. And uh, I think that's something that, uh, you know, at some point, Stephen could probably sink his teeth into far better than I could. <laughs> yeah, hopefully one of these I days like I'll get a chance. I was going to say, though, to kind of to flesh out what uh, Chris was saying about um, Lockheed. Uh, Lockheed is definitely a major, major player. It's extremely powerful. And uh, to give you one instance of this, it was one of the major funders for years for an organization called the American Security Council. And nominally, the ASC liked to depict itself as a think tank. It was essentially the far right's answer to the Council on Foreign Relations during much of the Cold War. But beyond that, it was a vast, vast private intelligence network. It, a lot of it, what it engaged in was blacklisting. Pretty much anybody who was hired for an industry related to defense during the Cold War probably would have had to be screened by the ASC who compiled dossiers, I think at one point, and almost four million Americans or something like that. They contained massive files and essentially did work that the government could not do after the McCartney flap in the 50s and so forth. So Lockheed, it had a tremendous amount of access, or I mean, it was very tied in with the ASC, which was a huge private intelligence network. And the ASC was also connected rather bizarrely to the UFO community. Of course, a lot of the uh, early members of the ASC were also in NICAP, the first really big uh, you know, post-war UFO committee and so forth. Uh, you had a lot of other people like Curtis LeMay, who was big in the UFOs, uh, Barry Goldwater. And then going into the 1980s, Aquino himself was linked to the ASC, though he's denied that, but I don't believe him in that instance for various reasons. John Alexander was never directly linked to the ASC, but he was involved uh, with the organization I mentioned earlier, the uh, U.S. Global Security Committee or Council, something to that effect. Ray Klein, the founder of that, had been a longtime figure in the ASC. Uh, another guy who was tied into the ASC who had a lot of interest in UFOlogy uh, was Stefan Posny, who would go on to become essentially the father of uh, the strategic defense initiative, Star Wars, if you will. So the ASC is definitely an organization that seems to have kind of covertly managed the UFO community on some level throughout the Cold War era until it kind of started to peter out in the late 1980s. But you still see some of these individuals that were kind of linked to that network, like Aquino and uh, um, Alexander, who were still, you know, major figures in this. And all of these, you know, operations kind of going back were founded by Lockheed in part. So Lockheed has probably been having this influence for just years now. And for the listeners at home, I think a lot of people might not realize that Lockheed to this day still has its own kind of intelligence organization within it. The Vegas shooting and all the mysteries and things that don't add up surrounding it is something you should look up in uh, Chris's entries in The Secret Sun, but it's something that Chris was trying to do the podcast circuit for for a little bit, and Richard Hoagland wound up having a terrible amount of technical trouble when trying to have him on the show. I tried to have an episode of The Farm, and Chris and I had to record it some three times because every time we'd play it back one of us was missing in the conversation or just some other technical thing would would happen it seems uh for a little bit there there was a window of time when there was you know discussion was uh prohibited in one way or another without any clear rules about it in the next uh show that hopefully we can do as, as another sequel to this one i think a lot of the things we talked about in this show about 1947, um, we can we can expand on. But if you reverse reverse rather the 47 to 1974, it seems to be a year of almost uh, spiritual or transdimensional or psychedelic esque contact. So 1947 is when UFOs are raining down from the sky and then we have Roswell and all these sightings and flaps in 1974 is when you have Robert N. Wilson, Philip K. Dick, John Lilly, Jack Kirby, Sun Ra, William S. Burroughs, Bowie, and countless others bringing all of this material directly into their art, making albums or comics or uh, writing well, so multiple books. I'm sorry. 74, actually, also probably even more significantly was the year that uh, Puharic published Yuri 2, which was, oh, I wow. believe, the first time, yeah, the public at large really kind of got an indication of the nine. Uh, and then, of course, you had the whole, you know, scandal with Watergate. I've written on this before, but I definitely think there were kind of uh, indirect links to the nine with Watergate in much the same way with the Kennedy assassination, specifically mm -hmm. through uh, one of the Watergate plumbers, uh, James McCord, 
who had worked in the Office of Security quite extensively in the 1950s. The OS is what oversaw Artichoke, and McCord was actually probably the man who had investigated slash covered up the death of Frank Olson. So, I mean, he was very well connected to a lot of these guys in Artichoke, which had it you know, an obsessive interest in paranormal phenomenon and all the whole nine yards, more or less. And you mentioned that term plumbers and just bringing everything full circle in a confusing way. The cartoon show Ben 10, which had a lot of the writers that came from the other cartoons I mentioned had false flag invasions, has a old boys network, a twilight boys network, something equivalent to the older men, some of which who have passed over now, like Bob Dean. Who were the first people saying they were actually, you know, saw the alien body or they were in a, a position in naval, naval intelligence to know things about multiple species of aliens and, and things like that. In the cartoon, there's a version of these older guys who have UFO information and still work in some intelligence capacity and they're referred to as plumbers in a, in a <laughs> kid's show, you know, that none of us would have watched and unless I w- went way out of my way to check out. I think, I don't know if you guys are sitting around with Saturday morning cartoons to this day, but I certainly am. Um, <laughs> is there anything else anybody wants to add before we wrap this guy up? Yeah. Yes. I just, oh, go ahead, Stephen. Oh no, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. No, I <laughs> just want to, I'm going to say, you know, I'll, I'll say something and, and I think Stephen could probably, um, expand on it, um, pretty well, but, um, there is, a a very strange <clears throat> and interesting lineage. Uh, Stephen had done a very fascinating and well-researched uh, piece recently on Lovecraft. And and one thing that I would raise and, and something that, that Gordon White and I had discussed, and one thing that I've thought all along is that, you know, I very much believe that uh, Lovecraft himself was kind of under the thumb of uh, certain intelligence uh personages um you know first of all he had done uh, a book with houdini and it houdini of course as many people know was british intelligence but there was also another um author who he seemed to have uh you know quite strong ties with whose um resume just screams intelligence and i i think uh these uh, you know, a lot Lovecraft fans will be familiar that he he traveled around a lot, and uh, you know it seems obvious to me, and, and and I think you know Gordon is very much in agreement with me that um, he was acting as a courier. That uh, I you know I believe that Lovecraft had probably gotten into some trouble uh, in in Providence of of what they you know would call the uh, moral crime uh, type, and um, was probably put under the thumb of people involved in intelligence and uh, was tasked to you know do the very miserable grunt work of uh driving around the country on buses and uh delivering um uh documents to various uh agencies and so on so i i think that you know this connection that we you know we talk about where lovecraft is uh basically taking ideas from theosophy, which has its own uh, intelligence uh, connections, uh, feeding them up through, uh, you know, Kenneth Grant, certainly. uh, And Kenneth Grant, you know, this mysterious uh, mystery man, uh, man behind the curtain, feeding to all these other things. And he's really the guy who takes uh, the ball and uh, combines uh, Crowley's occultism with, with ufology. So, uh, you know, there's this uh, a very strong through line here and, and a lineage, you know, tracing back to at least the, uh, the middle of the, of the 19th century and uh, straight up today. And, you know, seeing somebody like Lavenda who sort of straddles the world of uh, intelligence and uh, Lovecraftian and Crowley and a cult strong indicator that this, uh, this little witch's brew is still very much uh, at, at work in the world today. Surely. Yeah. And I don't think it would hurt to uh, actually, I think it'd be very beneficial to add Gordon to the conversation next time if he's up to it, because I think he has a world of knowledge that none of us can access sometimes. And Stephen, if you wanted to just expand upon uh, that little uh, daisy chain, I think that would, um, you know, whether not now or whether in a a future post, I think that would be uh, a a really fascinating read, you know, given the fact that the, um, this connection between occultism and, and intelligence seems to be baked into this pie uh, from day well, one. 
Well, I can kind of give you a little more. Uh, actually, this is one of the things I wanted to get into before we wrapped up. Essentially, how you know this might have gotten into the process of weaponizing uh, occultism, so to speak. Of course, earlier Chris was talking about how this stuff has been around for a lot of years, and there's no question. But the thing that's interesting to me is how it got into the emerging U.S. intelligence community at the onset of the uh, Second World War. And an interesting figure to look at in that regard was a man named uh, Henry Stimson. Stimson was the uh, Secretary of War, which was the predecessor to the Secretary of Defense back when we had the War Department rather than the Defense Department. But anyway, Stimson had originally served under Theodore Roosevelt, who his family has a lot of really interesting connections. It is still very powerful to this day, let's just say. But uh, I'm looking more when he was appointed to be the Secretary of War for another Roosevelt FDR. Now, Stimson was a member of Skull and Bones, and when he got into the War Department, he brought in some other bonesmen with him. Uh, one of them was uh, Robert Lovett, and another one was Harvey Bundy. Uh, this is from the Bundy family, produced several other uh, high-ranking figures, also in Skull and Bones and so forth. Now, these guys get into the War Department, and uh, they help set up this curious entity that was known as the... Um, the National, uh, where was it here? The National Defense Research Committee, which was eventually subsumed by the Office of Scientific Research and Development. Now, the man who oversaw both of those was a figure who should be well known to UFOologists, and that was uh, Vannevar Bush. So he's the guy who was heading all of this. And these two entities were very significant on a lot of levels. For one hand, a lot of the early kind of experimentation with uh, truth drugs, quote unquote, was carried out by some of this, specifically in Division 19, working with the OSS. The guy who oversaw Division 19, which came up with these kind of crazy ways to assassinate people and this truth drugs and so forth, was a man named H. Marshall Chadwell. Chadwell would later join the CIA, and he would become the head of the Office of Scientific Intelligence, which briefly oversaw Project Artichoke, why Chadwell was the head. Chadwell was also the guy who had pushed um, for the Rob was it the Robertson panel, I believe, the big UFO thing. Was it Robertson or Robinson? Robertson. Robertson, okay. Robertson, the guy who the panel was named after, had also been involved in the uh, National Defense Committee, National Defense Research Committee with Bush and all these other guys. Now, one of the things, though, that it just kind of occurred to me that's very interesting, the National Defense Research Committee, its big legacy was really uh, the nuclear weapons program. You know, that's what the public is really, you know, kind of fixated on more so than the weird stuff that was going on with Division 19. But the whole thing with the nuclear weapons research program, I mean, this has really played into a lot of bizarre theories, uh, kind of as Chris was alluding to earlier, so as was depicted in Twin Peaks, where... The explosion of the first atomic bomb had effectively opened our world up to, let's just go with sinister forces or something to that effect. And it was this committee that had sponsored this and had led to the explosion of Trinity in New Mexico. And New Mexico itself is very significant in this kind of legacy of high weirdness. Of course, the Roswell crash allegedly took place there, something that I think Chris accurately described as a working more than anything else, a magical working. And then to this day, you've got Los Alamos there. Uh, and of course, Jeffrey Epstein even set up one of his more enigmatic properties there, which seems to have been one of the areas where he was going into some of this, uh, you know, bizarre research that he was engaged in. So New Mexico definitely, I mean, is another one of these kind of areas in the country that seems to have been significant in this kind of legacy. And it seems that it was originally started by this, you know, these bizarre things that were being carried out by the National Defense Research Committee, which had later spawned, you know, these mind control experiments with the CIA, these, you know, the, a lot of leading UFOologists and people that were linked into this. And then it does, I think, in some levels beg the question, especially when you look at the kind of the presence of these skull and bones types at the War Department who were pushing for this kind of stuff, you know, was there actually an agenda behind the nuclear bomb and the explosion at Trinity that went beyond the war efforts? You know, was there something else more esoteric at work here? And, you know, beyond question, I, you know, think that these people were very much true believers. I think Chris had kind of alluded to this in our last chat, but I mean, part of the, you know, fact that you're getting a lot of this kooky science that is probably, you know, ridiculous, uh, may well be driven by the fact that there is, you know, a religious component to it um, with some of these occultists that are within the ruling elite. 
are they pushing for these things, this, what I guess you could say arguably is junk science, and did that kind of have its origins going back to the nuclear project, which obviously was valid science, but, nece- you know, but may have also had an agenda that went well beyond the war effort. Well, you only have to look as far as Parsons and the people around him being so integral in building that bomb, and then the interpretation of those sinister forces by government agencies that may have had no idea what they were talking about, but they were trying to get a grasp on it, like the Collins elite. Oh, absolutely. I mean, obviously, there's the question of the legitimacy of the Collins elite, but I mean, yes, there is something to this, I would imagine. And uh, of course, you had Hubbard, you know, lurking around in the whole background as well. He was involved with Parsons and uh, what was it, the Babylon work? Babylon work, yeah. yeah. And then Hubbard was, uh, of course, going back, uh, an Office of Naval Intelligence man. And uh, I haven't been able to definitively prove this, but there's a very good chance that uh, Hubbard had served in the ONI in um, New York City, I believe, in late 1942 with a man named Morris Allen, who was also part of the ONI. Morris Allen, of course, was the man who would go on to oversee the day-to-day operations of Project Artichoke. So, you know, you have this kind of weird interconnectedness. Hubbard's hanging out with Morris Allen. He goes out to California in the post-war years, hooks up with Parson. Meanwhile, Morris Allen is still, at this time, overseeing Bluebird. It becomes Artichoke. They start looking into all of this crazy stuff. Chadwell's there with them from the com- uh, National Committee, on uh, the National Defense Research Committee. So, yeah, I mean, it's just an incredible series of connections. And, I mean, surely all of these people were intertwined, as Chris had kind of alluded to earlier at this point in time, the 1940s, 1950s, the people interested in this stuff was a very select group. It just did not have a lot of, you know, large scale interest from the general public. It was a very elite network with people who probably, you know, all knew one another on some level. Well, they all prepped together. They're all from the same social circles. Yes. Yale. I Um, mean, the whole Ivy League circle. Absolutely. Yeah. They're all, you know, peas in a pod. And I, I, you know, they... Um, you know, you can't underestimate the um, the networks involved with uh, Freemasonry and the senior societies and uh, just, the you know, the fraternity system in, in general. And you also had a lot of um, more esoteric uh, kind of groups like the Rosicrucians and the Martinists and all the way up and down the line that were, um, you know, really just ways of uh, selecting players you know and for those interested in nuclear demonology or alienology if you will if you didn't get the point from chris's last talk with gordon and the ruined soup about invisibles and uh oh boy what's the uh the alan moore providence um go check out invisibles because they uh, grant morrison sort of suggests a lot of interesting visuals and philosophy behind those ideas all right, so gentlemen, are okay to wrap up? Did anybody else have a, a last note to add to anything? Well, I guess I could throw in one little teaser about Lovecraft here. I, I'm not sure if I'd actually mentioned this before, maybe on Chris's blog or not, but I don't think so. But uh, Chris was going into some of these strange trips that he was taking all across the country when uh, you know travel was not necessarily easy or cheap. And uh, one of the places he ended up was my old stomping ground in uh, Volusia County, uh, specifically to a town named Deland, uh, which is where his... Um, young acquaintance, uh, Barlow, what was his first name? He was the one who went on to become a writer. Uh, Robert Barlow. Yes, yes, yes. I believe essentially Robert Barlow's parents had kind of set up a quasi, you know, little shed or something on their property where uh, Lovecraft and Barlow used to uh, sit around and discuss uh, their yeah, various that's what projects. Were doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They were yeah. just sitting around and discussing various projects, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, okay, Deland, okay, it's got a, very, very impressive Masonic Lodge there. Uh, I've been into it. Uh, it was actually constructed specifically so that there would be no shadows cast in it. But uh, more interesting for our purposes here, Deland is about five miles from a place called Casadega. And this was a spiritualist commune. It had been set up by the spiritualist church uh, around the late 19th, early 20th century, the same group from New York State. It's a very weird place. Apparently, they alleged that spirit guides had guided them to it. It's Even its landscape is very alien to Florida. Florida is an extremely flat place. Casadega is surrounded by hills. I can remember specifically there is one hill there that almost every time I would drive my car up to it, it almost felt like a force was grabbing the car and pulling it upwards. 
there's a bizarre cemetery there that has again generated a lot of local lore around it with all of the really elaborate headstones there they have obelisks and so forth in them uh there were two chairs there that were made out of brimstones that are known as the devil's chair and god's chair certainly i had some kind of strange experiences with those back in my uh, profane youth but Casadega is a place that was kind of reputed to be uh, kind of a center of power, if you will, maybe something on the ley line, if you go and subscribe to those kind of notions. So, yeah, I definitely think that's really curious that uh, Lovecraft was uh, about five miles from that place with his um, yeah, teenage uh, friend in the uh, isolated shed where they were, you know, discussing their writing or something to that effect. <laughs> and then perhaps next episode, it would be a good idea to, get into serpent mounds it's something that's highly connected to all of lavenda's work and theories about everything from serial killers to ley lines but steven i want to send you a video that came out recently in just the all of the weird random paranormal videos that come out of people supposedly catching ghosts and demons or whatever where there's a cemetery with a particular hill where a gentleman repeatedly demonstrates that he can put his car in neutral and it'll be driven up and down this particular hill by some energy or force. But anyway, everybody, thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you guys for sitting in with me again and having this talk. I want to give a special a shout out and a special thanks to Jeremy for running all the visuals and the technical aspects of today's show. That's why we didn't we didn't hear much from him today. And uh, thank you guys, everybody. Have a good night, and thanks for listening. Back to you again, Mia. All right.